Okay, so Bakari, great to see you, my friend. It's been a while. We have a lot to talk about, so we're just going to jump right into it. See, I'm sure that you've heard Trump's recent comments about bloodbath and all that, but he's in the middle right now of four criminal trials, yet he manages to say those things without any consequence at all. Would an average person be incarcerated by now for what he's been doing, including the four criminal trials? I don't know if they'll be incarcerated by now. That's tough to say because everyone's entitled to a bond. He he doesn't have, you know, just to, to be ex extremely blunt, everybody knows, and, and you know this better than most, unfortunately, but there are two reasons that you have a bond or don't, or don't have a bond is because, um, one, uh, you're a danger to the community, or two, you're a flight risk. Um, is Donald Trump a flight risk? The answer is no. He's one of the more pop famous or infamous people in the entire world. Um, is he a danger to the community? Many people would argue yes. Um, I don't think he reaches that threshold. I do think, however, that there would be a judge somewhere that would tell him to shut the fuck up. Um, I, I think I think that would happen, um, um, particularly when you're facing this many um, felony indictments for bad behavior. Yeah. So can we just break down the whole concept of a flight risk? The flight risk scenario, in my estimation, has nothing to do with whether or not you're famous, whether or not people know who you are and recognize you. My understanding of a flight risk is that you have the ability within which to go to a, we'll call it to a foreign location because of one of many different things, right? One, he has multiple aircrafts that can take him overseas. Two, he has properties overseas in Ireland and Scotland, not that they would let him in, but he has properties in Ireland and Scotland. He has overseas bank accounts. And he has these four criminal trials right now that if, in fact, that he is held accountable, could equate to over 700 years of incarceration. That's how I kind of look at the concept of a, being a flight risk. Yeah, no, a, a flight risk is 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 leaving and, and not appearing for your court dates or absconding justice. That's kind of the definition of it. Just because you have a plane that goes overseas, what is he going to run from authorities in an airplane that says Trump on the side? Is he going to go and hide out in a Trump property? I just don't find that to be realistic. I, I think that I do believe that Trump will have his day in court. I do believe he'll be found guilty of uh, the case in D.C. and the case in Florida. I just think Georgia's going to take too long um, to bring. I, I imagine that will end up in some guilty plea two or three years down the road. Um, and what I think about that's New York? Like to the, huh? And what about New York, the first case that's going to end up going to trial and possibly the only one? No, I, I, I de DC is definitely going to trial. Now, Florida, they have an interesting judge. I don't make it a habit of talking to judges, because talking about judges, because I still practice law. And the last thing I want to do is be in front of her. And she tells me I was talking shit about her on the Michael Cohen podcast. And she remembers that. Uh, but the judge, the judge in the judge in D.C. is going to is going to move this case. Um, I think that the I just think those two federal cases are stronger cases. Of course, New York is a is, is a, I believe, a slam dunk case. But I just think the other two cases are stronger than than that one. Oh, absolutely. You know, we talk about it not just on this podcast, but I've talked about it uh, on multiple different television shows. I'm not really sure I understand why the pundits are constantly handicapping which case is more despicable towards America and our democracy than the others, right? You know, a crime is a crime. And I compared it at one point in time to figure like um, an assault, right? You could punch somebody with your hand. That's an assault. You could hit them with a pair, with a pair of brass knuckles. That's certainly an elevated assault. You could hit him with a baseball bat. That may be even worse, right, than the brass knuckles. Or you can actually shoot him, right? You know, they, they're they both, they, you know, they all fall under assault. Why are we now handicapping which assault is worse than the other? 
right? Clearly, obviously, the gun is the worst. And I would probably say that's the January 6th insurrection if I had to handicap them. But I don't know, passing around top secret, you know, um, for eyes only documents and refusing to return them and showing them as if it was like you're showing a Honus Wagner baseball card. I don't get it, but I don't know why we're constantly handicapping which one is more illegal than the other. A violation of the law is a violation of the law. I I don't disagree with you. I, I think that people are having a hard time because we've never seen this type of behavior before. I mean, we've never seen someone exploit the better angels of our nature, right? We've never seen someone defecate on the Constitution uh, the way that that this man has and is. And so, and there are a lot of people who are fearful because they they just have a mistrust of the justice system, and rightfully so. And that mistrust of the justice system believes that that power will not be held to account. And so there are a lot of people who believe that there will be no holding to account of of Donald Trump and he's going to walk away. I don't think Donald Trump is going to prison. I do think Donald Trump will be a convicted felon. And then what happens after the conviction at sentencing? You believe that they'll give him some sort of a very significant home confinement? They certainly, if he's convicted, there has to be a consequence. The consequence can't just be, hey, like Michael Cohen, you have a federal ID number, right? You have a, uh, you know, a prison but ID Michael, number. you know this better than anybody else. I mean, it's going to be his guideline range. And since we're going in the weeds on this a little bit, and, and this is cool because I like going in the weeds on your show and with you in particular, uh, your guideline range and the enhancement thereof is usual, has a great deal to do with your, it's a T-chart. And at the top of the T-chart are, is your criminal history. You are one, two, three, four, five. And coming down on the left side is the level crime that you've had. And in the middle of the chart has the months that you'll be sentenced to. Because he's a zero in terms of criminal history, there is a likelihood that the number of months he has will begin with a zero. It'll be zero to 36 or whatever that is. I don't You know, that's not how it worked. That's not how it worked for me, by the way. I never, not only have I never had a, a criminal past, my entire life, I have one speeding ticket in 1985. What was, your, what, was your, uh, what was your guideline range? It was something like uh, 30 months to 78 months. Yeah. And where did the judge fall in the middle of in, in that in that range? 36. 36. Yeah, I, I believe. I mean, look, I mean, you were on the lower end of. But if you're but my point is, if your criminal history was five. Michael, and you had those those prior convictions, et cetera, you'd still be locked up today for the same charges. No. Sure. I mean, you know, everybody should get locked up because another guy got his mushroom dick pulled by a porn star, right? And he, you know, and he asked his, you know, his lawyer to take care of it. I certainly understand that. While of course the guy who had the affair goes, you know, scot free. My point is just using your analysis. I had zero as well, and they didn't start mine off with a zero. Well, I, I mean, do if, believe, if, if though. Get it, has to, it has to do with the level of crime that you've committed. And what I'm saying is the level of crime, I do believe classified documents may be higher. And so it will be um, the, a judge will have to have a downward variance or a downward departure to get to a probationary sentence. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'd be interested to see if that judge does that. I know the judge in Florida will do it, but I'm interested to see what the judge in DC would do if he has a guideline range on whether or not she sends him to prison or not. I just have a hard time believing they'll send the form of, I think they'll, and I also think they'll hold the sentence in abatement until after the election. Well, you know, we have a problem with that too, because one of the arguments routinely is that we live in a country with a two tier system of justice. And that's not right. You know, as a lawyer, that Lady Justice wears a blindfold because it's not supposed to matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're black or white, whether you're tall or short, male or female, right? What religion that, you know, you ascribe to. It's not supposed to matter. Justice is supposed to be blind. And to others in New York, as an example, who have been found guilty 
of business record fraud um, and some of the other charges that they've now raised against him uh, by the Manhattan DA. These people do anywhere between, say, 13 months or a year and a day and three years. So like you, I am curious as to what the sentencing will ultimately be. It could work one of two ways. You're right. It could work that because he's the former president, he's running, that we have to extend him yet again, despite all of the shenanigans and horse shit that he's pulling in the courts, we have to extend him certain, um, let's just say, you know, uh, c- certain latitude that yeah. they would not extend to the average person. Right. On the other hand, the judge could say, whoa, 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 we need to treat him no different than we treat the average Joe or Jane New Yorker that's being charged with this. I mean, that that, that is that is the analysis. I mean, that is because I think you and I both believe that the evidence in both of those cases and, you know, the federal government doesn't swing and miss. And this is one of the most um, consummate professional prosecutors I've ever seen in Jack Smith. So, I mean, the, the outburst in court, those things just aren't going to they will put they will put him under the jail if he does the, the same things he did in the the New York civil trial in a federal court. And so all of those dynamics and the fact that he has to be in court. I mean, does he come out every day and treat it like COVID and make a speech after every single day of court with all the cameras there? I mean, does he come out and act like Michael Jackson? Remember Michael Jackson stood on top of the sure. on top of the black escalate? I mean, I think he does I all sure of those. Do. I think he does all, all of those things. And I think he talks about the judge outside of court. It's 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 going to be fascinating to see again to where we started the conversation. It's going to be fascinating to see how the justice system treats this man and whether or not they treat him like they treat my clients, like they treated you. And I just I can't fathom that they will treat him like that. I think that they will treat him unjustly, unfairly. And, it, and people will ask, why is it unjust and unfair? Because I think they will treat him differently. Yeah, and they will. So look, false claims of voter fraud clearly mm-hmm. weaken our democracy. I don't think that anybody can disagree with that. Are you, Bakari, concerned about how Trump and MAGA world have already started to circulate the big lie again? Yes, but I'm also interested to see how many from MAGA world actually make it onto a ballot. This next few months is going to be important for democracy. And the reason being is when you have people like Carrie Lake on a ballot, who's nuts, by the way, um, when you have other individuals who are on a ballot who ascribe to those notions, those individuals weaken democracy. And I'm trying to I'm interested to see if they will still carry the same weight in the in the uh, in the Republican Party and particularly in the primary system and emerge as candidates for United States Senate or Congress, et cetera. Because if he has a lot of warriors on the battlefield who are asserting the big lie, that becomes more of a dilemma for us. <laughs> you think I mean, again. The Donald Trump playbook, it's so easy to understand. There's never anything new or novel about what he's doing or saying. He knows he lost in 2020. He can't acknowledge or reckon with the fact that he lost to Joe Biden, let alone anybody, because he's a winner, right? All the time. We're going to have so much winning. There's going to be so much winning that you're going to get sick of winning. And so, Well, so far, I don't see that winning at all on his side. So what does he need to do? He needs to preface the loss that he knows he's going to sustain in 2024 with the big lie, too. So right now, where are we at? We're at the Biden-Trump 2 rematch, and he's just going to recirculate the big lie, too, as well. That's what they're going to do in order to keep fundraising and keep trying to stay relevant. I I agree. I mean, I I think that he's going to circulate the big lie. He's going and the the, I mean, it's not just him. I mean, it's the ecosystem that he's built. It's the Fox News. It's the Tucker Carlson's. It's the Elon Musk. You know, it's it's this. You know, he Twitter has changed completely. It's done a complete 180 from you know, this exchange of thought to, to, to porn and, 
you know, xenophobia and hate speech, right? And and conspiracy. Wait, 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 hold on. Wait, wait. This porn on on X on Twitter? Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, offline, you're going to tell me what some of these sites are. I haven't seen that yet. And I only I mean, have just, like, I, like you know, I don't know what my algorithm is. Maybe I'm telling it on myself. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Listen, I think sex work should be legal anyway, but that's a whole nother story. Um, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's this ecosystem that he's built between social media, the news, pundits, et cetera, that will. Um, create a silo where individuals will just go in these places and the ignorance will just manifest and breed and bounce off the walls. Yeah, you know, about a year and a, maybe a year and a half ago when Elon Musk first bought uh, Twitter and I was asked to be on a panel, five people speaking and Elon was the guest. He had just purchased Twitter and I had asked him, what was he going to do about the bots and the bot farms that exist on the platform that have basically taken over conversation? You know, if you put something out there, Bakari, that is anti-Trump or anti-Republican or anti-MAGA, within seconds, there's thousands of responses to you, most of which aren't spelled right. They are, um, you know, repetitive of the guy before them or the woman before them or generally a cat, uh, a dog, a deer, a buffalo, um, a gorilla. You know, they have these, um, you know, they're not people. They have animals and they have flowers and God knows what else. Anyway, these are all being paid for by bot farms, and their sole purpose is to change the conversation. So I asked him what he was going to do about it, and he said that they're working on a couple of solutions. I gave him one, which was create a two-part authentication for each, of those, um, for each of those accounts that would prevent them from opening up thousands of accounts under the same like email address or what, or what have you. And of course, they didn't do it. I think X right now has fallen as a platform of legitimacy. And that actually saddens me because whether you agree with me or not, or whether I agree with the other person on the platform, at least you could exchange ideas. But you kind of knew that you were speaking for the most part to another live individual and not a bot. <laughs> 90% right now of what I'm seeing are bots. And worse than that, the algorithm of X doesn't even allow you or I to get our message out to all of our followers, because unless you have like the check mark or you fall within an algorithm that they want it to fall under, they ghost it. They ghost the response. I'm certain of it. So Look, I, I don't know where I fall in the spectrum of X anymore. Um, when it was purchased, I had, I'm going to pull it up. I had 400 and had 405,000 followers. Um, I now have 398,000 followers. And I have not only lost followers, but I gained followers at about one one follower a day average now. Um, and so I don't want to say I'm shadow banned or anything like that. I don't know what I am. But you do know that voices of change, progressive voices, et cetera, are all muted on. Um, there are people who tell me all the time I don't even pop up in their feed anymore. And that's that's just troubling. But you also know what type of person Elon Musk is for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is a bad business deal. They're hemorrhaging dollars and losing a bunch of money on X since he bought it. Number two, you saw how he behaved when he was trying when he was held to account by our good friend Don Lemon. Yep. Um, and you know, good luck trying not to pay him the rest of that contract. You know, so it it, it being held to account is just not something that and, and the racism is always there. And this is something I talk about in my new book, uh, The Moment. Um, you know, we we've kind of browbeat ourselves into not even becoming desensitized to Russian interference in the twenty. 16 election, uh, 2020 election. 
Um, but there were entire farms like you were talking about that were their sole focus was to stir up animus within the black community, particularly black male voters um, and spread misinformation and disinformation. I fear that, you know, who they just brought on a campaign again yesterday. Did you see who got hired? I, on the Trump I did. Paul Manafort. Paul Manafort. It, it's it's eerily similar to the same playbook all over again. And, um, you know, he was you know, he, I guess I, it's, I don't know how to describe people who've been pardoned. I should know this. My dad was pardoned. I guess he's still a convicted felon, but bringing back a convicted felon when those type of foreign ties who've already been convicted by a jury of his peers for um, atrocious behavior to do the same thing over again is, is nerve wracking for me. No, and it should be for everybody. By the way, if you get pardoned, that felony goes away. You know, uh, the whole the whole thing kind of gets expunged, you know, by presidential, from my understanding, you know, it's by presidential proclamation. That's really what the pardon, uh, what the pardon is all about. Um, but I'm still hoping for one from Biden. So we'll see. Because rest assured, I was never getting one from Donald. That's for sure. Now, had I kept my mouth shut, had I done nothing, had I refused to speak, Clearly, I would have gotten one even before Manafort did or Roger Stone yep. or any of them. But I didn't feel that that pardon is as important as America's democracy. And I made a decision myself early, early, early on that my wife, my daughter, my son and my country have my first loyalty. And I wasn't sticking around for, you know, for that option. Though I will tell you, my life would certainly be much easier right now. Yeah, uh, listen, you, um, I mean, you were courageous. And I don't use that word lightly because you have a beautiful family, beautiful daughter, and you um, were taken away from your family. And that's what people have to realize. You were taken away from your family um, for doing what was right and owning up to your mistakes. And that that hey. that is called courage. Yeah, and it's, it's it's not just I who suffers. You know, my I have a son also who is an amazing, amazing uh, baseball player, big, tall, lefty pitcher. And I mean, you know, he he was training since he was five years old. His dream was to play in college, and that's where I was at USC, doing a scouting uh, interview with my son and the coach when they said I was in Prague. And that's the crazy thing, because then the FBI went there, spoke to the coach, and he said, nah, they were here the other day. We, you know, we were putting him through, uh, through this, he, his son through drills, and he was sitting right there on the, you know, and then afterwards, the following day, I went over and I hung out with uh, Harvey Levin uh, at TMZ on his new set, and they asked them too, but nope. Nobody wanted to talk about the truth on that, because it didn't fall within the narrative that Donald and Barr and the rest of them had all set up, which was to hold me, to push me under the bus, accountable for Donald's dirty deeds. But speaking about being held accountable, dear old Donald von Schitzenpants can't post the $464 million bond in the New York civil case, right? Our unsinkable New York attorney general, Tish James. And Tish turned around and said, that she is ready to start going after his assets. No matter how she extracts value from his properties, Republicans are going to say that it's a political hit job. How do you think that she should best proceed with this? Oh, she's going to stay focused. I mean, I listen, I, I, I ain't going to be giving Tish James no advice. She's done her job very, very well. <laughs> uh, I think that, that Donald Trump's going to have a problem. I think the fact that he can't post the bond is not a I thought there would be one company out there, at least one of the 30 that would help him out in this situation. Boy, were we wrong. Um, I, I think that she will begin the process of seizing his assets um, and it's going to affect not only him, but also the two boys. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know why he just doesn't go get the money from Ivanka and, and, and Jared. They, they probably got it from all of their business dealings with Saudi Arabia and everybody else when they were in the White House. Um, but this is going to be a very, very painful experience for Donald Trump.
Yeah. I don't think that one Jared can do it financially. You know, a lot of people, I've heard people, I've heard pundits say, oh, you know, he got over $2 billion from the Saudis. You know, he could he could make the loan to his father-in-law and so on. And I'm going to tell you, they clearly don't understand what a money manager is. Just because the money manager, Jared, has $2 billion of commitment from the Saudi Investment Authority doesn't mean that he has access and control to use that money any which way that he wants. That yeah. is for specific investment purpose, and it has to be approved by the Saudi government. And if, in fact, they did get it from Jared and it somehow managed to trace back to the money that's given to Donald, I said this last night on both CNN and MSNBC, that's a bigger problem for us as America than even the fact that a former president has been indicted four times on criminal charges, because it would mean that if God forbid a million times that he ended up back in the White House, he yeah. would be indebted to a foreign country. Correct. And rest assured, they would call in that favor. No question. I think that's the biggest problem. I mean, even if, let's say he's indebted to a bank or family office. Think about the favors. When they pick up the phone and call him, he has to do what they say or else they call that loan. I mean, that's a, you're, you're highlighting a fundamental problem of having this type of significant debt while you're running for or, God forbid, being president of the United States. And this is a very, 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 very close race. Yeah, I don't think it's as close as people think. I know that the polls want to show it that way. It certainly keeps everybody glued to the television and to their new favorite news channel. But I don't think it's as close as possible. You know, I saw the other day as well. Um, hey, who was it? Oh, uh, uh, Harry Enten, uh, who I think the world of. I've had dinner with him a couple of times. Uh, he's a funny as hell guy. But he was talking about how the black community are increasingly being drawn to Donald Trump and away from Joe Biden. And I scratch my head and, and I say, how is that even possible, considering the racist comments that are continuously emanating from that gigantic gaping hole underneath Donald Trump's nose that makes his asshole jealous? He is constantly saying racist shit. He has no affinity or he has no affection towards minority communities. Why in the world would they be leaving somebody like Joe Biden, who is an empathetic individual, who actually cares about America and American values and democracy, versus a guy who, again, cares for no one or anything other than himself? The answer is they don't. I, I don't believe the polls about black voters at all either. I mean, I, I think you're right. I think the polling has been very skewed. I think, I mean, it's, it's just troubling the way that people have this perception that Donald Trump's going to get more than 20% of the black vote. He's just simply not. Um, that, or the, and, but and the analysis, to, yeah. The analysis is not Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. The analysis is Donald Trump versus Joe Biden versus the couch. Now, the question is how many black voters will stay home? And, you know, that is more dangerous to Joe Biden than black folk voting for for uh, for Donald Trump. I mean, there, there is this belief somehow that black voters are unsophisticated and that's just not the case. And I have to remind people of that on TV all the time. Yeah. Yep. And I'll go one step further. While I understand there's a bunch of MAGA women out there that 100 percent want to be controlled by their husbands as if this is Gilead. I don't understand it. Certainly, I I don't try that shit with my wife. I don't want to get hit in the head with a frying pan, right? Or or you know, or a shoe. Uh, I mean, you know, that shit just doesn't fly in my house. It didn't fly me growing up. My mom would have whacked me across the side of my head with anything that was close by. I don't understand it, but what I do understand is that even those women don't understand what Trump and his now newly Supreme Court um, judges or 
the IVF scenario, the overturning of Roe, and it's it's more than even just the overturning of Roe. It's even more than the nonsense that they are trying to impose regarding uh, in vitro fertilization. It's the fact that Donald Trump takes pride in the fact that it is only because of him that he was able to overturn Roe v. Wade and starry decisis that existed for 50 years. He takes it as a badge of honor as if he invented the cure to polio. Yeah, and it's going to be a problem for them in November. And I think that there are going to be a lot of white college educated women who live in the suburbs of Michigan, um, who live in the suburbs of Philadelphia, who live in the suburbs of Milwaukee, Raleigh, Durham, Phoenix, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada that are going to um, that are going to take Donald Trump down in this election. Elevate every morning with Tommy John's second skin underwear. What you put in your pants can make or break your day. And the luxurious support of second skin guarantees everything will go smoothly. When you wear Tommy John, you're much more comfortable so you can do everything better. Tommy John's stylish and second skin underwear has dozens of comfort innovations like a supportive contour pouch and breathable, lightweight, moisture wick fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. And who doesn't need more stretch? With over 20 million pairs sold and thousands of five star reviews, guys like me everywhere love their Tommy John's. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics like this one who raves that they are the most comfortable boxer briefs ever. There's no downside. Buy one pair and you'll never want to wear any other underwear again. Now, let me tell you why I love my Tommy John second skin underwear. It doesn't matter if you're a lefty or a righty. With Tommy John's horizontal quick draw fly, you get unparalleled, unfurling access. And we all need access. And with Tommy John, the legs never ride up, the waistband never rolls down, and every pair comes with the Tommy John's trusted no wedgie guarantee. So take it from me, these second skin briefs are second to none. That's why I'm telling you, you should get Tommy John too. Plus, your most valuable assets are always covered with Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or its free guarantee. For silky soft comfort and sophisticated style, check out Tommy John's luxurious second skin limited edition colors right now at TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. They're going fast, so hurry to TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. Look. If reproductive rights was a huge issue in a place like Ohio, and scratch Ohio, Kansas, of all places, you just know that it's going to play extremely well. Um, because I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure my Republican friends have done the calculus right on how angry many voters are, particularly women voters, about about Roe and about uh, Roe being overturned, and rightfully so. I mean, rightfully so. You know, the fact that my daughter has less rights than my grandmother, I just find defensive. I find it's setting America back 100 years. And instead of growing and being more inclusive and more accepting of one another, I think that the overturning of Roe, the overturning of the Dobbs decision, the effect that that's having on other cases like Bivens, or Obergefeld, which is same-sex marriage. I think it's a real problem, and that's why I don't believe any of the polls. But you brought up Georgia, because I'd like to move to Georgia for a quick sure. second. What do you think of Judge McAfee's ruling on Fannie Willis? And in your opinion, was he playing politics, or do you think it was a Solomonian type of a um, decision? He split the baby. There, there was no... The fact is, she wasn't there. It, so this is where it gets confusing for people, because was there the appearance of impropriety? Yes. Was there any proof of an actual conflict? No. That's the answer to the question. In Georgia, that matters. See, in South Carolina, just the appearance of impropriety 
you have you have to remove yourself. But in Georgia, that's not the case. The the rules and regulations, ethics rules, say that you have to have an actual conflict. So should she have been left on the case? Yes, it was a bit it was a bit political, uh, Solomonian as you called it, to split the baby and say, well, you can stay on the case, but you got to kick your boyfriend off the case, right? Um, that makes literally no legal sense, but it was cute. And he's able to go back and, and do the things he needs to do, like win re-election. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that. You know, I'll tell you, there were so many questions that I would have asked of Fonnie Willis that weren't asked. Like, um, yeah, I'm going to play the prosecutor. I'm going to play uh, Trump's defense counsel, right? Or, all right, and you play Fonnie Willis for a second. So I said, uh, Miss Willis, did you engage in sexual relations with Nathan Wade? Yes. Can you do it like Fonnie Willis, please? <laughs> no, I'm not mocking <laughs> Fonnie because I, Fonnie okay. will beat my ass. And then, see, her. then <laughs> see, then I would turn around and I would say, well, would you say that the sexual relations were good? See, they didn't ask the right questions. And then I would say, did he last longer than Donald lasted with Stormy Daniels? Right? And then I would say, can you describe, you know, does he have a mushroom pecker? Right? I, they just didn't really ask the right questions. You know, it, it was too, I thought the whole thing was ridiculous and it was, you know, I, I almost felt, too, okay, let me get serious for a second here. I there actually was one felt very, star. I felt very, there was yeah, that's the father. The Yep. Her father. Her father was a superstar. Her father reminded me of he's very, very smart, competent lawyer, taught her a lot of life lessons, reminded me of of my uncles and everything. And it was just kind of fascinating to it was fascinating to see um, uh, him have to go up there and go through this and have to educate the um uh, have to educate the, the 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 masses about culture and his daughter. And, you know, she's still there. And the, the problem that Donald Trump and them have is they pissed her off. So now the person that you have to go to for deals and stuff like that, she's going to be less likely to do that because you just drug her ass through the mud. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the point I was trying to be um, comical about. I found the whole thing to be absurd. I'm really uh, upsetting. I found it to be absurd. You know, she is the DA. I could understand the appearance as being inappropriate, but I'm still trying to figure out how their sexual relationship, whether it ended before or after, right? To this day, I still obviously don't know. I wasn't there, so I don't have any firsthand knowledge on any of that. But how any of that has any bearing at all about bringing a case against Donald Trump. In fact, if Nathan Wade wasn't competent, if I was Trump's attorney in this case, I would want him to stay on the case because his incompetence, like the way that Trump's lawyers, like an Alina Haba, have ended up resulting in a loss in every single case that they are attached to. I would want Correct. him on the case. That's why I'm not mad at Alina Haba for going to the, not in she with the RNC now? She's like their general counsel now. I have no idea what she is. She's general counsel. You have uh, Christina Bob, who's another one that's attached no, to it. Christina Bob yeah. is the one who's going to, yeah, that's the one who's going to the RNC. But yeah, I, I don't mind either one of them. And Lara Trump. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, it's just a family affair. And it, unfortunately for them, more appropriately for us, uh, it's just a bunch of incom incompetence. And I think we'll be okay with that level of incompetence. Oh, yeah. I love listening to Michael Steele talk about it, that Lara Trump has no idea what she's getting herself into. But in fact, I said to him the other day privately, you got to be careful when you say that, simply because Lara Trump knows exactly what her marching orders are. You go to every yeah. single Republican on that donor list and you get them to donate as much money as they possibly can. And 100 cents on every dollar is going to go to Donald Trump whether it's going to be for his legal fees, whether it's going to be for ads, because he's not raising the money that he's going to need to compete with the Biden campaign, not even by a long shot. Can I just jump into something additional here? Because I understand that Georgia Republicans have already said that they want to open an inquiry into Willis 
and possibly charge her with perjury. How hard do you think that that's going to be for Willis to try this case, especially if that's still looming in the background? I think she'll just focus on the issue at hand. And that's what she has to do. I mean, you can't worry about all of that other stuff. Her office is more than capable. Um, it was interesting to me that they outsourced this prosecution from the jump. I was, it's a huge office. Um, and I'm sure they have capable lawyers. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming they will just keep it internally now um, and that maybe not contract. And she'll focus on that. And look, they'll have a team of lawyers that are dedicated to this. They have a lot of trials going on down there. They have the uh, YFN just, just pled, but they have YSL trial which is a huge trial with Young Thug and a RICO case. Many, many, many um, uh, accusing him of being a street gang and it's many, many defendants down there. I, I don't have any, I think the fact that she made it through this storm, um, she'll make it through any storm they throw at her. Yeah. Listen, I, like I said, I sympathize with her. I've been down, I, I've been through that storm, unfortunately, um, more than a dozen times already, you know, from the Mueller report, to seven congressional hearings, to DA, to New York Attorney General, now back to the DA, and possibly even back for another congressional hearing. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's exhausting. And I feel for her, and she should not have and been you're not, And you're not done her. yet. You still got to testify in the New York trial. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, subpoenaed for that one too. Can we jump for a second to the Mara Lardo documents case? Because on Monday evening, Judge Eileen Cannon proposed a fucking bizarre, bizarre. I don't even, I can't, you, if, I need, if I were to know you were going to ask me about it, I would have told you in a text message, I don't know what the fuck she did. I can't yeah. answer that. I've never seen anything I, like it. I don't know I mean, what the purpose this, of it is. Yeah, this bizarre jury instruction that basically says either the jury can read top secret documents or Trump is acquitted. I mean... Let me ask you this question. How do you think Jack Smith is going to respond? Because I know how Bakari Sellers is responding, and I think it's pretty much the same way that Michael Cohen is. I don't, I mean, Jack is probably shaking his head and saying, this lawyer doesn't know what the fuck she's doing. I mean, this judge. No, she's the first, judge. The judge, yeah. She was She was deemed to be unqualified anyway, but I'm going to stop talking about her because I have cases down there. Um, I do not know how he will respond. I'm interested. I will read his response. In full, I will not skip it. I will read it in full as soon as it posts, because that was one of the more absurd pre-trial. And I, you know, I do not know a way that a jury, and I don't even, know, I don't understand why the government and his lawyers won't stipulate to them being top secret. Like that should be a stipulation, right? That the documents that they have are top secret. Thereby, you don't have to read it to determine whether or not it's top secret or not, because you know what? You know, people, me and you can't determine whether or not something on a sheet of paper is top secret or not. We might read it and be like, oh, that's some crazy shit. They got aliens out there. You know, this should be top secret, but we don't know what is and what isn't. I mean, we, we just have an untrained eye. So I don't know how a jury would be able to determine that. So it should be something stipulated to. And I don't even know why we're going down this road. Th this is a weird thing that she's doing. I'll give you my opinion on this one. I believe that Trump's lawyers already knew in advance that these Correct. bizarre jury instructions were going to be offered by Judge Cannon. That either you allow, which nobody's going to allow, a juror to read top secret documents. If, first of all, could you imagine what you're talking about? You got 12 jurors and then two alternates. 14 people who are being given classified information. And those 14 people could basically tell two people or five people or what has, and write they end book, up with 100 a people it. out there. Write a book about it. Write a book about it. They can do whatever they want with it. So then the question becomes, either we can get them to stipulate that they'll allow the documents to be read by the jury and then basically place America and our national security or whatever the topics are in jeopardy, or Trump becomes acquitted. So do not fight, right? Claim, you know, claiming that the top secret documents should be considered and kept top secret. I mean, that's who's representing the guy 
the orange-crusted Mandarin Mussolini narcissistic sociopath who happens to be the leader of one of our two political parties. Can you imagine? This is where we're at. I would have never guessed that this is where we were. But you know what I will say? Hillary Clinton warned us that we could end up here. She was right about every fucking thing she said about Donald Trump. And that's unfortunate. I, democracy is fragile. I think we've learned that. She's very, very fragile. And one man who's a bull in a china shop who doesn't care about anything but himself can rip her away at the threads. And that's what he's trying to do. Yeah. And then, of course, she got the Supreme Court. Except recently, right, the Supreme Court determined that they were not going to hear Trump's immunity case until late April and then probably won't rule on it until early, you know, maybe until early summer. Why, in your opinion, Bakari, is the court bending over to help Trump? I mean, they must know that a Trump second term not would be a disaster, but will be a disaster. I don't think they're trying to help him. I think that they are going to reaffirm the ruling of the district court, why they are not just allowing it to go without a hearing and affirm that ruling is, is, is a little weird to me. But I do think that John Roberts wants to have some unanimity about the fact that he can be prosecuted. And I think they want to write an order that's very similar to the order that was written in the um, Colorado ballot case. And I think that's what they're going for. I may be wrong, but that's why I think they're having a hearing and doing it this way. I, I wish to God I had the answer. I really don't. You know, very soon, the case that I brought against the United States government, Donald Trump, Bill Barr, on the Bivens violation, on the unconstitutional remand of me back to prison because I wouldn't waive my First Amendment constitutional right based off of a counterfeit document, no less. It was dismissed by motion. Imagine this, by Judge Lyman, who actually wrote an incredibly strong opinion that's in my favor, that he doesn't have a choice because of the overturning of Dobbs and the fact that the Dobbs decision neuters the Bivens case, we took it to the second court, to the uh, to the second circuit, the Court of Appeals, and three to zero, they upheld Judge Lyman's decision. So now we're going to go to the Supreme Court because one of the parts in it, and I don't understand why we're even getting this far into it, the Egbert case holds that Unless it is of the most unusual circumstance, Bivens should remain. But if it is of the most unusual circumstance, Bivens gets applied. So I would ask you, as the brilliant lawyer, former member of the House, what could be more unusual than the President of the United States weaponizing the Department of Justice against a critic remanding him back to prison because they he wouldn't waive his First Amendment constitutional right off a counterfeit document. What could be more unusual than that? I don't have an answer. <laughs> well, I let's think, hope that... I, I think you were fucked. <laughs> Is that a legal term of art? <laughs> yes. we'll, we'll make it. We'll make it Latin. Fucked up, this, right? I mean, I mean, they can just, they can I, it, make that the order and just leave it at such. <laughs> right. Well, my hope is that the Supreme Court takes our writ and we get a chance to, because just that decision on Egbert actually came from Justice Thomas. So, you know, how could he not explain what he meant by of the most unusual circumstance? Because that was one of the questions we asked the three panel judge. Please tell us what would be more. In fact, that one of the judges turned around and he was very hard on the Southern District's um, attorney, on the government's attorney, and said, what's the deterrence factor here? And they said, well, there are 
Bureau of Prison Administrative Remedies. And he goes, you're joking, right? You think that's a deterrence that you got to go back to the same people that unconstitutionally put you in? How about try again? And it was nice because it was, you know, it was you could log in and listen to the hearing on audio. Um, it, it, the whole thing is just stupid. But speaking of Clarence Thomas, this is a guy who has not yet recused himself in any of the insurrection cases, despite the serious conflict of interest that we all know. Of course, his Clarence wife Thomas Ginny, is a human. He's a human conflict of interest. I mean, whether or not it's it's whether or not he's getting he's getting flown out like one of the city girls on these trips, whether or not he's getting schools paid for for his children, Jenny's text messages in the January 6th. I mean, I just I, I have a fundamental problem. And that's one of the things and that's one of the reasons that John Roberts is bending over backwards to try to preserve the integrity of the court in some shape, form or fashion. And I don't know if he's doing it well, but he knows his legacy will be tarred by somebody like Clarence Thomas. And he Clarence is not going to recuse himself, although he has more than the appearance of impropriety. Going back to something we mentioned in Fannie Willis, he literally has a conflict, an actual conflict. Yeah, I mean, but he is likely to have. He will likely be a deciding vote in terms of whether or not to hear the immunity case. So my real, so the question I also want to ask you at this point is, do you think that somehow Clarence Thomas is looking for a way to grant Trump immunity to protect himself and his wife? I never thought about that. I just thought he was an unethical jurist. I haven't thought about whether or not he's looking for immunity to protect his wife and himself. Um, I know she's a witness. I know her text messages. And the fact that he is he is ruling on this make it disgusting. But we've seen the articles, the ProPublica articles about Clarence Thomas over and over and over again. So this should not surprise anybody. No. No, it shouldn't. But let, let me move on and ask you this thing, because there are a lot of red states that have put voter suppression laws on the books since the last election. Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and Iowa. They all took steps to make voting more difficult. How do you see it affecting the election? How do you also see it as it's affecting huge. minority communities? Hugely, hugely. I mean, it's the, the voter suppression uh, through ALEC pushed laws and agenda items, particularly throughout the South, have a huge effect. This is not new, however. This has been going on since at least 2010 after the election of Barack Obama. What you're seeing is the continuing thereof. And so this has been a huge problem for a long time. It will affect minority voting. It just means we have to work that much harder. Georgia's laws are absurd. You're starting to see many people duplicate the laws that are in Georgia. And so this is something that we have to be mindful of. This is why every election matters, even your local elections, your state elections, they matter. And I try to tell people that all the time. You can't just vote for what happens at 1600 Pennsylvania. You have to vote for all of these elections. <laughs> That's true. Now, let me go to one additional thing, because one of the other topics that you hear regularly from the pundits is that Trump is uh, that Trump is gaining in the Muslim community, and no. that Muslims are in droves, in droves, just withdrawing their support for Biden. No, they, and a they, lot of them no, that, turn around. That, that, that could be true, right? You could be withdrawing your support from Biden, but that doesn't mean you're going to vote for Donald Trump. I have a hard time believing that our Muslim brothers and sisters are going to withdraw their support from Joe Biden and, and jump over to Donald Trump the same person who put in a Muslim ban, travel bans, et cetera. I do not on see that. On day happening. one, on day one, it was the first bill that he tried to pass. And of course, when I was with him in the Oval Office, he blamed it on Steve Bannon and Steve Miller. But I say that to my friends who are Muslim all the time. And, you know, and I, I say I say to them, I don't think you I don't think you understand what you're even saying here. You're talking about a guy who you're angry at because of what's happening right now in Gaza. I'm curious, though, how do you think that the Biden administration and Chuck Schumer 
you know, who came out the other day and was very critical uh, and, you know, withdrawing their support of Netanyahu. How do I you think, think that that's going to play to the community? Like they always talk about the Muslim community in Michigan. How do you think yeah. that that is going to is going to play in terms of trying to win back those voters? Yeah, I think I have a problem with the framing of the discussion that we have many times around what's going on in Gaza, because there are many people who ask for a ceasefire. But many times those remarks are just one way. Um, and, and I need the same type of energy to say that Hamas uh, needs to also have a ceasefire, that they are the ones who you know, committed the heinous acts of October 7th and that um, Israel has not had a day without peace and rockets flowing um, from Gaza. Um, for a very long period of time, which is why we have the Iron Dome. And so and, I do think... And return the hostages today. Immediately. 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 I mean, this is absurd. And so that's how I look, That's how I frame the focus. And then um, Bibi Netanyahu is an impediment to, pre to, to peace. We know that, um, you know, the, the settlements, the, continue, the continuing building of settlements um, and settlers are an impediment to peace. We know that. Um, but I think that the Biden administration gets a cessation of fire before um, the election. And I think that helps a great deal. I totally listen. I totally agree with you. Can I ask you this question? Because you and I have had these sort of similar conversations offline over the now many years that you and I know one another. Except it's on a much broader basis, because to me, it seems like much of the world has forgotten that civil rights are a good thing. What do you attribute the rise of popularism around the world to be? What's, ca what's causing this? Fear. Fear. Of? The browning of this country. Um, I think that you have fear of being replaced. I think that you have fear of the unknown. I think that there are a lot of people the way that I define supremacy is people who think equality is oppression. Expand on that, would you? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of individuals in our fight, your fight, you're joining my fight and everybody's fight to have a more equal and just society. They feel like when other people have those same opportunities that they've had for generations in their entire lifetime and lifetimes before them, that somehow they are now being oppressed. And that feeling that that equality to them feels bad and feels wrong when other people are just trying to eat from the same plate. Right. I mean, I, I certainly understand the concept that Donald Trump and MAGA are espousing, which is white replacement, right? They're, they're losing their white privilege. I never really saw it that way, to be, on, to be honest with you. And maybe because I happen to be white, I never felt the, I never felt it. You, 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 I don't know if I'm making much sense, but what I don't understand is why all of a sudden after we have all grown that civil rights have been so such an integral part of America's history over the last hundred years. And it's not just civil rights for, you know, for for blacks, it's civil rights for women, for LGBTQ plus communities and others. I don't understand what it's really causing this regression. I, I just don't see it. Yeah, I think we, this is what I write about in the moment, it comes out April 23rd. We're going backwards in the racial reckoning we thought we were happening, having. It's just, it's, it's, not ha it's not there. And it has a lot to do with the fear that we have in society. We talk about Florida's policies and books, Georgia, et cetera. You just see us regressing on the issue of civil rights. Yeah, and look, I, I, I don't even know where to sort of explain that reason, this rise in this popularism. Since Trump started his nonsense, I think just year over year, anti-Semitism has increased by over 2,000%. And yet, and yet, he comes out with another statement the other day, more, more ridiculous than the statement before it, because every day he has to outdo himself, that if you are Jewish and you don't vote for him, 
you hate your religion, and you are anti-Israel. I don't yeah. even know how, I don't know, is it while he's sitting taking a shit that he comes up with this nonsense? Or is he sort of like um, using AI and typing in, what would be the most racist thing that I can say to a Jew, but are you assuming that they don't vote for me? Are you surprised? No. Okay. This is the same man who's been doing this his entire life. He's born into it. There is nothing, there is nothing that surprises me about his anti-Semitism and his racism or the things that he's saying or doing. And we just have we can't become desensitized to it because it's dangerous, but there's nothing we can we can nothing he's saying should be of any surprise to any of us. So Bakari. The hour goes by very quickly here on Maya Culpa. I have one more question to ask you, and it's obviously it's a personal one to you. Sure. I understand that you have a new book that's coming out in April, and it's yes. called The Moment. You referenced it earlier in the show. If you can, what can you tell us about the book? If you can give me like one or two interesting tidbits about the book, and what really, why did you decide to write it, especially at this moment in time? I was a little bit fearful of, of where we are as a country and where we're headed. It, it ties right into the conversation we're just having. And I was so, and maybe I shouldn't have been, but, but I was so excited about the direction of this country post George Floyd. Um, and then we, we were going through this moment of emerging from COVID and we didn't really learn our lessons from COVID. We didn't learn about the systemic inequities that we're, we're dealing with. We did not learn our lessons from George Floyd and we're starting to see regression uh, on the issues that I care about, issues of justice, issues of peace, um, issues of equity and equality. And so I wrote the moment. Um, and, you know, I think it gives people a look good. It's very, very, it's very provocative. Um, and I challenge people in their thought process around those individuals like Tucker Carlson. I challenge their thought process around individuals like, um, like Stephen A. Smith and Ice Cube and others. Um, and so for me, this is just a way to, to get my thoughts out there. It comes out April 23rd. I actually read the book as well. So if you want to get the audio version, get it. But thank you, uh, Michael, always for supporting me. You, listen, you know, I'm a big fan and I'm going to recommend that everybody um, get the book the moment because rest assured, um, Bakari is truly a special guy. And Bakari, let me thank you for joining me on Maya Culpa. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for your, your um, advice and your intellect. Appreciate you, my friend. And I will definitely be having you back on the podcast very, very soon because we have a lot to talk about.